Thank you, Andrew. Nineteen seventy five, Anthony King wrote a very, very influential article where he talked about government overload and the collectivist consensus. And he argued that government was seen as an unlimited liability insurance company, insuring people against any conceivable risk. He argued that government couldn't deliver because of the unreliability of internal and external actors. Now, this is relevant because it hits on an emotion which I think is terrifically important in understanding politics, and that is whether or not the public always expects too much from government. There was much discussion of this in the mid-1970s. This is the article to which I've uh, referred here. But also, if you cast your minds back to the ludicrous sense of over-expectation that followed the election of the Blair government in 1997, the ludicrous sense of over-expectation that accompanied the uh, election of Barack Obama. Now, this is relevant because, of course, Brexit is a tremendously important thing, a tremendously uh, a fork in the road for, for, for British politics. And it seems to me that many Leave voters will never be happy with the pace and the extent of change. Within a day of the result, the Labour leader foolishly was calling for Article 50 to be invoked immediately. It's now been put off till March the 31st at the latest. For some, that's still not uh, sufficiently rapid. So I think there's a, a potential for inevitable discontent. But there's also potential for inevitable disconnect. Writing in 1941, George, George Orwell referred to the mechanical snigger of the Bloomsbury highbrow. Now, this was a, he was actually talking about patriotism in the context of the Second World War. But actually, I think Orwell's insight is important here because we are already seeing the mechanical snigger of those who cannot accept the result. The cry of what did they expect? The fools voted for it. And the long, drawn-out process which will inevitably follow Brexit will not help. Brexit is not going to be over by March the 31st. It will be a long, drawn-out process, far longer than the two years for negotiations. And each side will grasp whichever indicator supports their case. Today, uh, those who are leavers, the so-called, uh, sorry, uh, remainers, the so-called remoners, an awful, awful phrase, highlight the value of sterling. Those who are cheerleaders for leave talk about the high value of the FTSE index, but perhaps most importantly, the unavailability of Marmite, which is the thing that will affect people immediately. So, does this mean there are inevitable problems ahead? Both of these things matter. The, dis, uh, the discontent with the pace of change, the discontent from those with the mechanical snigger. The likelihood is, I think, that if both of those forces remain unchallenged, there will be a growth in dissatisfaction with government and politicians more generally. Now, you might say, well, there already is, but boy, can it get worse. We saw that over the expenses scandal and the dangers that that uh, can deliver. Now, whether that uh, uh, dissatisfaction is justified is irrelevant because the inevitable perhaps inevitable discontent and disconnect, has the potential to make politics a dangerous place, a collapse in government confidence and dark forces circling. So we have responsibility as citizens. We have a responsibility to recognise that government is a difficult and grown-up activity and a responsibility not to simply write it off as somebody else's problem. Now, there are other political consequences, and those are for Parliament. There is a significant potential over, the, over time of there being paralysis in Parliament. Because we've had 40 years of EU law, which has been put in place, where we've not got uh, a simple uh, GB law uh, mirroring that. All of our EU law will ultimately need to be re-legislated upon at some point. Now, David Davis in Parliament on Tuesday 
spoke of a, uh, a Great Repeal Bill, arguing that this would happen after the Great Repeal Bill. Well, that's useful for certainty in the short term, but it simply puts off a problem for tomorrow that we may, that we may need to deal with today. It is not simply a question of crossing out the EU and putting in the UK, not least because not all legislation emanating from the EU has been uncontroversial. Who wouldn't want clean beaches? Who would contest, for example, things about workers' rights? And it is not easy for a government with a small majority. Don't forget, Theresa May's government has a smaller majority than John Major's government in the 1990s, which, of course, um, ultimately collapsed uh, by 1997. The vagueness about what Brexit means. Theresa May has taken it upon herself to say it's about immigration. Well, the question on the ballot paper was not about immigration. The question on the ballot paper was, do we want to remain or do we want to stay? Whether people voted for that reason is another question. So Brexit is likely to overshadow all other government policies. And we used to talk in terms of post-war British politics of the 13 wasted years of Conservative rule from 51 to 64. Well, I think we can certainly look forward to four wasted years in Parliament, and the question is whether it will be only four. But there is some good news. If you're a commercial lawyer, if you're a lobbyist, this is fantastic. The lobbying business has never known such a, an upturn in business as a result of Brexit, and quite reasonably so. Nobody knows what's happening. They need people to explain it to them. So there's good news for some, perhaps not good news for others. Finally, I want to turn to the United Kingdom, a point to which Demetrius referred. And in the aftermath of the Brexit vote, Nicola Sturgeon jumped up and said there will be a second referendum. That's now receded, partly because it's not clear that a second Scottish referendum would produce a different result at all. Because part of the argument um, that was attractive to people who wanted to vote independent in Scotland was that there would be common policies with the United Kingdom, travel, security, currency. That would be impossible if Scotland was in the EU and the rest of the UK was not. Not only that, if Scotland was independent and part of the United Kingdom uh, and part of the European Union, it would have to conform to EU fiscal rules in a role that was much more strictly enforced than was the case uh, with the United Kingdom. And this collapse of the oil price is likely to make independence far less attractive. So ironically, Brexit might well be the saviour of the United Kingdom. There's also a threat to the open border, border with Ireland. It's not only costly if a hard border goes up, but it's also hugely symbolic. It is, of course, only 20 or just uh, under 20 years ago, 18 years ago, that we had the Good Friday Agreement, which brought peace, lasting peace to the region. That is threatened by hard border. So in conclusion, I hope I've not been too depressing. There are very difficult times ahead, but I reiterate my opening point. We have a choice as citizens of this country. We can either make the best of this, regardless of whether we will remain or leave, or we can let the dark forces triumph. And I think the answer to that, question, the answer to that choice is unequivocally that we should make the best of it. Thank you.